All right, <clears throat> chapter 36, Neonatology. Um, if we look at some basic definitions, a newborn is considered the first minutes to hours after birth. And a neonate refers to birth to 28 days. So when we talk about neonatal resuscitation, um, we're referring to that first 28 days of life. And uh, when we look here a little later in the talk uh, about how to resuscitate uh, a neonate, uh, it is quite different than the standard um, infant CPR that you're taught in basic life support. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk first about some transitional physiology or um, how the developing fetus uh, makes adjustments to uh, extra uterine life. Um, and then as they get, um, as they're intrauterine, uh, they do these things that we're going to talk about. And then as they get closer to uh, the time that they're going to be born, uh, there are certain physiologic things that must happen in the baby uh, prior to being born. And so we'll talk about those as well. And they're mostly related to um, cardiorespiratory. Um so some transitional physiology, getting adjusted to extra uter uterine life. Uh, initially, oxygen and nutrients and waste products diffuse back and forth between the placenta and the um, mother's blood uh, to the baby's blood. Um, fetal blood chemistry uh, alterations allow for uh, intrauterine survival. And what they're referring to there is that... Um, Fetal hemoglobin is 50% higher than maternal hemoglobin. And so as a result, uh, that, that can be a good thing, as in the case of hemorrhage uh, or as in the case of hypoxia. Um, but in the case of carbon monoxide poisoning, that extra 50% of hemoglobin can be uh, detrimental because we know carbon monoxide has a, a strong affinity to hemoglobin and uh, intrauterine um, Carboxyhemoglobin levels are much higher uh, than in maternal um, hemoglobin, uh, carboxyhemoglobin levels. Uh, the fetal circulation interacts with the placenta via the umbilical cord, and 50% of the blood flow uh, filters right through the mother's liver, and then 50% uh, of uh, the blood flow uh, goes uh, through the uh, developing baby's um, um, ductus uh, venosus. And um, that's a, uh, a duct that we'll see uh, that eventually closes, um, uh, as we'll talk about at birth. Um, fetal lungs are essentially non-functional. Uh, so blood flow for oxygenation through the lungs are not required. Um, intrauterine. Uh, the blood is shunted from the pulmonary artery directly to the descending aortic arch through uh, a ductus known as the uh, ductus arteriosus, and uh, we'll talk about what that later becomes as well. So here's uh, an example, or, or certainly an uh, a, uh, uh, illustration of the uh, fetal circulation, uh, where you've got the normal maternal circulation, and we're all familiar with blood flow to the heart. Um, but then in the developing baby, as I'd mentioned, 50% of the blood flow comes through the umbilical cord into, into the uh, uh, placenta, and then the placenta um, then uh, has an umbilical cord that comes off it and uh, feeds the developing uh, baby. The alveoli open. Uh, and they're initially filled with fetal lung fluid instead of air. Uh, and the pulmonary blood vessels constrict. And this all occurs before label, before labor. And the uh, fetal lung fluid uh, production is decreased by one-third right before labor. So uh, even before the baby's born, the, um, the, the uh, fluid-filled lungs um, begin to decrease in the amount of fluid that's in there. And then during the uh, vaginal delivery, the newborn's chest is squeezed uh, as it passes down through the um, birth canal. And that also reduces the fluid by an, another one-third. 
So by the time the baby's delivered, two thirds of the water that were in the lungs uh, has been um, removed. Um, the newborn must obtain nutrients and perform digestion and waste elimination and, and uh, temperature regulation immediately upon uh, birth. And uh, initially, their first breath requires a significant amount of negative pressure. Um, you know, we typically talk about pressures of um, greater than 19 centimeters, even in an adult, uh, will cause um, uh, dilation of the esophagus and air to go into the stomach during resuscitation. Um, and that's why uh, your pop-off valves on your bag valve masks are usually set to pop off at uh, 20 centimeters of pressure. Uh, and it has really nothing to do with the volume of air, uh, because once you reach a, a certain fullness or uh, of the lung, then it takes additional pressure to um, expand those uh, alveoli. And uh, once it exceeds 20 centimeters, then the pop-off valve goes off. <clears throat> but in the first breath or so, it does require a significant amount of negative pressure, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 30, maybe even 40 centimeters of pressure. Um, the alveoli are filled with air for the first time uh, at birth when they take that first breath. And uh, surfactant then helps keep the alveoli open. And babies that are born premature often lack surfactant and have to be um, given surfactant in order to help keep their alveoli uh, open. Um, uh, the initial cries and deep breaths that a baby does at birth moves the remaining fluid uh, out of the airways, and uh, all the fluid should be out of the lungs and the airways uh, in about 24 hours. And as the lungs fill with air, the pulmonary vessels relax, which then increases blood flow to the lungs. So the uh, pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins relax, uh, allowing more blood to be pumped to the lungs. And a reduction in pressure occurs in the right side of the heart as a result of the blood vessels dilating. But then there's also an increase in pressure in the left side. Uh, and this causes a closure of the foramen ovale, uh, which is part of the uh, transition to the normal cardiac uh, circulation. Um, reasons that transition, transitional problems might occur include the, uh, the newborn breathes insufficiently to force fluid from the alveoli and may require us to provide positive pressure ventilation. Uh, if they've got meconium staining, then the meconium may block the air from entering the alveoli. Uh, they may have insufficient blood return from the placenta before uh, and during the birth. Uh, and they may have just poor cardiac contractility, which can be directly related to things like hypotension, hypoxia, hypothermia, uh, depending on the medications the mother received prior to birth, uh, may all alter the heart's ability to contract hard. Uh, and all of these uh, transitional problems, of course, if left untreated, will lead to uh, hypotension and hypoxia in the neonate. Um, other potential transitional problems include, uh, include uh, bradycardia from insufficient delivery of oxygen, uh, insufficient oxygen to the brain and the muscles, insufficient oxygen to the brain itself, lack of oxygen or failure to distend the lungs with air, take that good first breath, uh, uh, which may lead to a sustained constriction of the uh, pulmonary arterioles, uh, which... Um, uh, won't be able to, um, um, you know, pick up oxygen that are in the alveoli. Um, some other transitional ph physiology that uh, occurs is that blood in the umbilical vein begins to clot, and it's uh, completely occluded in uh, two to five days. Uh, and interestingly, the umbilical vein becomes the ligamentum teres hepatis, and it's, uh, it ends up becoming a ligament, and this ligament uh, is um, on the bottom of the liver, and it helps hold the liver in place. Uh, but also, during a rapid deceleration, the liver can roll forward on the ligamentum teres uh, and actually uh, lacerate the liver, or cut the liver in half, <coughs> much like a cheese slicer. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, ligamentum arteriosum develops from closure of the ductus arteriosus. So when the uh, 
the um, lesser pressure on the right side of the heart and greater pressure on the left side of the heart occurs. That causes the ductus arteriosus to close, and then that becomes the ligamentum arteriosum, and that's a ligament that uh, holds the heart in place in the chest. But again, during rapid deceleration, that ligament can actually um, lacerate the, the aorta and, uh, uh, you know, cut it right in half. The ductus venous closure uh, is uh, become, when the ductus uh, venosus closes, it becomes the ligamentum uh, venosum. Uh, the septum premium uh, is uh, when blood flow sensation through the foramen ovale occurs. And the foramen ovale is a small opening in the septum uh, in the heart um, that uh, bypasses the non-functioning lung, lungs uh, during um, fetal development. Uh, so um, the right side of the heart, because of that hole in the septum, pumps blood to the left side of the heart and then to the developing fetus rather than pumping it to the lungs. Uh, and after birth, that particular foramen ovale is supposed to uh, close. And uh, you may have heard of people that have had a hole in their heart and have need to have it, have it surgically repaired. This is what they're referring to. Now, low birth rate uh, or a preterm birth is anything under 2,500 2, kilograms or any baby born under 5.5 pounds is considered a low birth weight um, baby. The, the less they weigh, certainly uh, the complications can be greater, and uh, birth weight is uh, certainly a product of uh, the mother's nutrition, uh, the mother's diet, the mother's lifestyle. Um, if she has severe preeclampsia, uh, premature membrane rupture will cause uh, low birth rates, uterine abnormalities, placental bleeding, uh, multiple gestation, in other words, twins, triplets, uh, drug misuse, uh, if the mother is chronically ill, if the fetus is in distress during development, uh, if the mother uh, has an infection, uh, trauma to the, uh, the uterus and the developing uh, fetus. Um, resuscitation is required for about 80% of the um, uh, low birth weight um, neonates. Um, the lungs often lack sufficient surfactant, so it's more difficult to ventilate them, not from the standpoint of putting the mask on the face and squeezing the bag and making the chest rise, um, but it does require a, a greater negative pressure uh, to uh, uh, get those alveoli to pop open. Uh, the brain substance is soft and gelatinous. Uh, it's easily torn, very fragile capillaries uh, that often cause brain bleeds during stress. Um, and um, the developing fetus is uh, more likely to be born with an infection. Um, temperature regulation problems are also a, a factor associated with increased risk for neonatal resuscitation. Remember when these neonates come out of the um, uh, out of the mother that um, their body surface area uh, in relationship to how much they weigh. Their body surface area is so much greater in relationship to what they weigh that you've got this big um, space that gives off a lot of heat uh, in the environment that they're in. And so um, certainly things like drying them, covering them, keeping them warm are really, really important. And part of one of the first things we do in neonatal resuscitation uh, is to um, avoid hypothermia. Um, some other factors associated with the increased risk of neonatal resuscitation, um, if it's a, a preterm um, uh, baby, and the antepartum risk factors include a maternal age greater than 35 years or less than 16, maternal preeclampsia or diabetes, maternal bleeding in the second and third trimester, maternal drug therapy, maternal substance abuse, Chronic pregnancy-induced hypertension, uh, which might be preeclampsia, chronic maternal illness, uh, maternal anemia and infection. And as far as um, anemia goes, remember we had talked in the, um, the OBGYN uh, lecture that in the third trimester, 
although a woman's blood volume has increased 25%, uh, her hemoglobin has not. Uh, and so she's uh, relatively anemic anyway. Um, some other antipartum risk factors for low birth rate include premature membrane rupture, previous fetal or neonatal death, uh, post-term gestation, they've gone two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Um, <coughs> again, twins, <coughs> triplets, that sort of thing. Size and date discrepancies. Um, you know, if the last menstrual period, if that's not uh, correctly identified and um, uh, measurements of the femur and those sort of things that they use to anticipate a uh, estimated delivery date, if those are off, uh, certainly that could lead to a low birth weight. Um, inadequate or no prenatal care, uh, diminished fetal activity, particularly in that third trimester, and then fetal malformation. Um, some intrapartum risk factors that occur uh, inside the um, uh, um, I inside the uterus include abruptio placenta, where the placenta tears away from the uterine wall, uh, placenta previa, where the placenta is um, delivered before the baby, uh, premature labor, uh, precipitous labor, uh, prolonged rupture of the membranes, uh, and that's been extended out, um, you know, quite a bit. Um, you know, initially when the bag of waters was broken, uh, you typically had to take the baby within the first 12 hours. Um, and I think they've gone greater than uh, 24 hours uh, with uh, after the bag of waters has been ruptured, as long as there's no fever in the in the mother. Prolonged labor greater than 24 hours. Prolonged second stage labor greater than two hours um, would be certainly uh, uh, factors associated with an increased risk of having to resuscitate the baby. Um, uterine tetany is involuntary contractions of the uterus, uh, not 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 the same as labor contractions. Um, narcotics administered to the mother within four hours of delivery, uh, certainly breach or other abnormal pre presentation, uh, fetal bradycardia, which is almost always related to hypoxia, prolapse cord, meconium staining, bleeding. Um, <clears throat> so in those situations where uh, uh, the likelihood of uh, neonatal resuscitation uh, would occur, um, there are some uh, other things we need to consider, like newborn asphyxia. Um, normally, with when you stimulate, when you provide tactile stimulation and drying, slapping them on the back, tapping them on the feet, uh, to get them to take their first breath, uh, newborn asphyxia is the inability for a newborn to begin or continue breathing at birth. Uh, so if we don't breathe for them immediately, um, they can uh, suffer from asphyxia. Um, remember with the uh, O2 deprivation that uh, neonates have a tendency, um, as do all children, to breathe faster than adults. It's not uncommon for a newborn's um, respiratory rate to be 40 to 60. Um, so your assessment that perhaps the uh, newborn is oxygen deprived would be a respiratory rate greater than 60, uh, a sudden drop in the heart rate, uh, the skin color progressively turns cyanotic then blotchy. Uh, they may suffer from primary apnea, which is where the breathing slows and stops, but when you vigorously rub them, then they start breathing again. Or they could be suffering from secondary apnea, which is the classic signs of hypoxia mentioned above, and they do not respond to stimulation. In that particular case, we need to begin resuscitation immediately. Remember that hypoxia in any patient, uh, particularly these um, newborns, uh, can lead to permanent brain damage. Some other factors associated with an increase for neonatal resuscitation would be congenital anomalies. Um, however, there are certain birth defects and uh, minor uh, anomalies that uh, are not an increase in risk uh, to uh, resuscitation, like uh, additional skin tags on the ear or uh, extra toes or extra uh, fingers. Um, some that are major anomalies that certainly may increase the risk of resuscitation include uh, an encephalocele, 
uh, which is what you're seeing up there in um, uh, slide A, um, cleft palate and lip, um, which you're seeing in B, uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, that's where the trachea and the esophagus are one, uh, diaphragmatic herniation we'll look at as well as conal atresia. And uh, conal atresia is uh, uh, soft tissue um, blockage of both nares, one or both nares uh, in the newborn uh, to where they are unable to breathe out of their nose. Um, esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula or TEF with esophageal atresia, that's failure of the esophagus to develop as a continuous passage. With TEF, that's an abnormal opening between the trachea and the esophagus. And cardiac abnormalities are more common with TEF than they are with esophageal uh, atresia. With esophageal atresia, what they eat develops into a, uh, a clex or develops into a pouch that never makes it into the stomach. With TEF, what they eat uh, may end up in the trachea. Um, they will show um, symptoms in the first few hours of birth uh, if, you have an, if you have either one of these conditions. They'll drool excessively, they'll choke, they'll cough, sneezing, uh, lots of secretions. Uh, remember that with the... Um, Esophageal atresia, the feedings are going to pool in the esophageal pouch. Uh, one other indication would be you're unable to advance an oral gastric or nasogastric tube. <coughs> With TEF, the fluid spills over into the trachea, causing cyanosis, wheezing, tachypnea, uh, and an aspirate pneumonia. Um, TEF without esophageal atresia. Um, uh, they'll have chronic respiratory problems uh, and repeated pneumonias from aspiration. Uh, to treat it, it requires adequate oxygenation, constant airway monitoring, uh, put them in an upright position to prevent aspiration, suction secretions, um, monitor their uh, respirations by pulse oximetry, and uh, cardiac monitor consult medical direction and transport. Now pulse oximetry of course is different in the pediatric population and how you apply it. Uh, same thing with cardiac monitors. It's uh, uh, You probably can make adult patches work um, but even the round patches you put on an adult patient's chest may be just too huge for uh, pediatric patients. And they do make specific pediatric electrodes. Uh, diaphragmatic hernia is where the abdominal contents uh, herniate up into the chest wall. Um, as you can see in this uh, particular uh, x-ray, the trachea and the heart have shifted completely to the left. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the abdominal contents uh, are not visible in the abdomen, but they are visible in the um, left lung. Uh, clear in the left lung, all the way up into the left lung, you see little pockets of, of uh, air in the, um, in the intestines. Um, this is more common on the left than the right. Uh, there are two holes in the diaphragm that allow for um, the superior um, vena cava and the abdominal aorta uh, come down through those holes and then spread out to your uh, pelvis and then uh, to your legs. And um, a forceful squeeze on the abdomen uh, during delivery uh, may herniate those contents um, through the diaphragm up into the chest. Um, there may be a small defect in the diaphragm as well um, or absence of the diaphragm on the affected side. It didn't develop. And again, it allows the stomach, small intestine, spleen, and spleen to uh, migrate up into the chest. Uh, the lungs are severely affected. The number of alveoli in the bronchial branches are decreased. So essentially, you're, you're ventilating with just not even one lung, but less than one lung because the heart and the trachea and everything in the mediastinal space is shifted over, compressing the right side of the lung as well. Signs of diaphragmatic hernia might be your history of a... Uh, 
uh, of how the baby was born. They'll have respiratory distress. They'll have bowel sounds in their chest. Uh, their breath sounds will be diminished. Their heart sounds will be clear to the right side of the chest. Uh, cyanosis doesn't get any better with be ventilation. And uh, the abdomen will be scaphoid or de devoid of, you know, usually they have little protruding abdomens, little round Buddha bellies, and um, you know, that's, not, uh, that's not evident in this case. Treat treatment is to give them high flow oxygen. You may have to intubate them and, and provide um, positive pressure ventilation, uh, an oral gastric tube to empty the stomach or any air that's in the stomach, uh, monitor their pulse oximetry and their heart rate, consult medical direction, and transport. Clonal atresia is where the nares are narrowed or blocked by a membranous or bony tissue. Uh, if, one, if it's only one side of the nose, it's called unilateral atresia. If it's both sides, it's called bilateral atresia. So if we're looking up the nose of this child, we see a unilateral conal atresia where the left side of the nose, is nair, is completely blocked with uh, soft tissue. And the um, right side of the nair is open. Conal with conal atresia, uh, you're going to have respiratory distress. Uh, they may be gasping or cyanotic, unable to feed and breathe at the same time. Um, maybe a lot of retractions because they have to work harder to breathe. Uh, they may have a foul-smelling discharge from their nose, uh, and they may suffer from uh, upper respiratory infections. Um, you know, babies are obligate nose breathers. And uh, so when they're born with both nares completely obstructed or one nair completely obstructed, it's very difficult for them to breathe. Uh, treatment includes airway monitoring, uh, insert an OPA, monitor pulse oximetry, cardiac monitor, contact medical direction, and transport. Uh, some other congenital anomalies you might see is Pierre Robin sequence. Um, and Pierre Robin sequence uh, is is evident when the baby has a uh, small recessed lower jaw. Uh, this allows that large tongue to fall back and down on the back of the throat, and they may also have an associated cleft palate with it. Um, they may not have airway obstruction, but uh, it's important that we verify their airway is open. If it's not open, you may need an OPA in order to hold that tongue up off the back of the throat. Um, if you're unable to uh, do an uh, OPA, uh, insert an oral gastric tube, uh, monitor their ability to ventilate with uh, certainly lung sounds and visual uh, appearance of their worker breathing, as well as a pulse oximetry and cardiac monitor, and consult medical direction immediately if there's uh, airway obstruction. Meningiomyoceles, um, they are neural tube defects. Uh, it may be the result of an incomplete development of the brain, the spinal cord, or the meninges. They include things like spina bifida, uh, spina bifida meningeocele, spina bifida meningeomyelocele. And here are some uh, meninge, um, meningomyocele. Uh, protruding out of the spine of these uh, of these newborns uh, and uh, that is the spinal cord uh, depending on how high this is uh, on the back of uh, the baby may determine uh, whether or not they're par uh, paralyzed from the waist down um, that sort of thing um, the spine does not close in the first month of fetal development. It's more common in females. It's usually the lumbar sacral region. Uh, it can be the result of a folic acid deficiency as well. Uh, again, the higher the defect on the back, the greater the nerve damage, the greater the muscle function loss, and the loss of sensation. It's a very vis visible spinal defect, because you saw that on uh, both of those slides. Uh, the baby may be flaccid and paralyzed uh, from the waist down may have altered bladder and bowel functions, uh, and may have no response to pain below the defect. They may also have club feet and his, hip dislocations as well. Um, preventing infection, protecting the exposed area from trauma. Don't place them on their back. Position them on their side. Uh, cover the wound um, to protect it. Uh, you know, Monitor the pulse oximetry and the heart rate. 
and look for early signs of increased intracranial pressure, which is a change in level of consciousness, uh, dilated pupil, posturing, those sort of things. <coughs> cleft lip and cleft palate. Cleft lip is an incomplete uh, closure of the upper lip. Cleft palate is an incomplete co closure of the hard and soft palate of the mouth. Uh, here's an example of uh, an individual with uh, cleft lip and palate. You can see that his lip is not uh, grown across, uh, and you can see that his hard palate uh, is uh, split wide open. Uh, and initially, um, when these babies are born, uh, they may hold off surgery as long as they're able to suckle, as long as they're able to feed well. Um, they may wait till the child is a little older uh, and able to um, and able to undergo perhaps the multiple surgeries it may require to repair that. Um, and as you can see in the bottom picture, um, there is a uh, uh, there's a cleft palate. Um, cleft lip and cleft palate. Uh, cleft lip could be on one or both sides. Cleft palate occurs in the midline and involves only the uvula uh, on one side, and it may extend into the soft and hard palates both. Uh, problems associated with the cleft lip and cleft palate include uh, aspiration, so you, we have to be vigilant for airway obstruction, uh, put them on their side, uh, monitor their pulse oximetry and their heart rate, and uh, contact medical direction and transport. Umphaloceles is a protrusion of the abdominal organs into the umbilical cord. Uh, it's also covered by a sac of the peritoneum, um, and the umbilical vessel is present within the sac. So here is a uh, umphaloceal uh, uh, here. And uh, they can be to the point where the abdominal contents um, come out through the umbilical cord and uh, feel the, fill the, uh, the sac. Uh, umphalocele, uh, they're going to have a really fat umbilical cord. Uh, it may include stomach, intestine, liver, and spleen all in encapsulated in that umbilical cord. Uh, rupture may occur immediately before or during birth, which of course is lethal. Um, our role is uh, to prevent infection through the exposed bowel, uh, protect them from trauma, put them on their side, uh, monitor their pulse oximetry and, and heart rate. Um, here Initial steps of resuscitating a newborn begin with your first impression, uh, answering the question, uh, sick, not sick. Uh, we all know what a healthy baby looks like when they're alert and they're cooing or they're recognizing their environment. Uh, uh, they're moving all four extremities well, um, as opposed to one who is uh, somnolent and uh, the eyes don't open, doesn't chlor or are glassed over, doesn't recognize their environment, that sort of stuff. So get your first impression and some will use the acronym PAT, the Pediatric Assessment Triangle, um, where your initial look is um, uh, appearance, um, worker breathing, and color uh, to determine whether or not they're, they're sick or not sick. Uh, keep them warm. Uh, cold stress increases oxygen consumption in neonates, can lead to metabolic acidosis, can lead to hypoglycemia, apnea. Um, uh, keeping them warm will prevent things like hypoxia and acidosis, as we mentioned above. Uh, and you want to not heat them up, but certainly prevent any further heat loss uh, upon their delivery. Uh, position and suction, put them on their back. When you're doing newborn resuscitation, put them in a neutral position so that they're not hyperflexed or hyperextended. Uh, put it so the um, tragus of the ear is pointing directly at the shoulder. It's called a sniffing position. Uh, remember that hyperextension or hyperflexion can cause airway obstruction. Uh, you can prevent this by putting a rolled washcloth or a blanket or a towel under their shoulders. Uh, excessive secretions need to be suctioned. Um, amniotic fluid needs to be clear of meconium. Suction the mouth 
then the nose with a bulb syringe or mechanical suction. And remember, we, we talked about in our OBGYN class that uh, suctioning of the um, newborn's airway begins at the perineum, not after they're uh, born. We'd hope to have them all clear by the time they're born. Uh, if meconium, but the new uh, newborn is uh, vigorous, uh, then uh, suction as you would above. Uh, if their level of consciousness is depressed, uh, delay drying and stimulation and immediately begin assisting ventilation. To stimulate the baby, rub the back, small of their back. It's a very tender spot. Uh, rub their trunk or extremities, tap or flick on their feet. Um, be aware of secondary apnea. Uh, that would be apnea that continues even after uh, stimulation. And we would need to aggressively provide positive pressure ventilation with a bag valve mask device. Uh, you want to give them oxygen to make them pink. Um, here, this is kind of misleading because we're talking about newborn resuscitation, but maybe blow by is all you need initially. Uh, holding a um, oxygen supply tubing at two to four liters a minute, uh, roughly, you know, um, two to four inches above their face and uh, see what that does to your pulse oximetry, does to their color, and um, back it off uh, slowly to wean them off the oxygen. Remember that the respiratory rate is pretty fast in that first 24 hours, but if it gets going faster than 60, then certainly we have a problem, or less than 40. That might be problematic as well. Their heart rate should be 100 to 180 beats in the first 12 hours. So heart rates less than 100 would be of concern, as well as heart rates greater than uh, what the American Heart Association uses is greater than um, 210. Listen with, uh, to the apical pulse with a stethoscope and feel the pulse, uh, grasping the base of the umbilical cord, uh, and match those up. Um, they should be the same. Um, apply a pulse oximeter, monitor their cardiac rhythm. Uh, if they're... If their heart rate is less than 100 beats a minute, begin positive pressure ventilation for two minutes. Uh, if the heart rate is less than 60 in an unresponsive uh, neonate, we're going to do chest compressions. And, uh, you know, consider if we can't get the blood pressure up with what we're doing um, to consider... Um, you know, further resuscitation measures. Uh, their cardiac output should be, as a newborn, somewhere around 500 mils a minute. Assess for central cyanosis. Uh, acrocyanosis refers to cyanosis of the arms and legs. So acrocyanosis is not a reliable sign for hypoxia. Look for pallor. That certainly is, as would be a rash. Um, APGAR scoring is something that we're taught uh, in school and it's in your book and it's addressed during newborn resuscitation and I'm sure there's at least one test question if not two uh, on how to do an APGAR score and uh, typically it's scored at five at, at, at birth and then at five minutes later but if you've got a really sick kid um, don't delay resuscitation to use the um, you know to figure out what their APGOR scar is APGOR scar score is um, APGAR stands for Appearance, Pulse, Grimace, Activity, and Respiratory Effort. Uh, ventilation, uh, bag mass ventilation may be needed for two minutes, and if it's maybe needed initially, and they should turn around quickly after you begin bag mass ventilation. If they don't, and you're going to ventilate them longer than two minutes with a BBM, then we need to consider inserting an oral gastric tube, uh, because no matter how good you are, you're going to exceed the needs of the lungs, and that excess air is going to end up in the uh, in the uh, stomach. And the problem with uh, air in the stomach is that now you've got this big balloon sitting under the diaphragm, and it's going to be harder for them to ventilate, and also increases their risk of aspiration. Um, you want to use a properly sized face mask. If your face mask is too big, it may rest on the eyes of the newborn. And any pressure on the eyes is a positive vagal stimulus and would slow the heart rate down. Ventilate them at a rate of 40 to 60. Uh, and um, if they're in full cardiac arrest, uh, the thing to keep in mind is that we don't give them one breath every three to four seconds like we do a 
an infant in cardiac arrest, because their ventilatory demands are so high, um, we give them uh, 30 breaths a minute. So uh, we do one breath every uh, two seconds. Um, often what they'll teach us in NRP uh, is um, you say, Bag the baby, 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 and that's your ventilatory rate uh, along with your um, chest compressions. Uh, you know you're going to be ventilating them adequately when you get a gentle chest rise. You may hear bilateral breath sounds. Their heart rate should go up. Their color should improve. Um, reasons that you might not be able to get good chest rise include a poor seal between the face and the mask. Uh, poor alignment of the head when you're opening the airway, insufficient pressure to dilate the airways open, improper tube placement, the airway is obstructed, or the patient is severely gastric distended. Um, after 30 seconds of adequate positive pressure ventilation, you want to recheck the heart rate, color, respirations, and if they don't improve, you want to consider endotracheal intubation, or they do make a king airway that goes all the way down to neonate. Here they're showing you the example of an oral gastric tube insertion where you're measuring the tube across the nose, the ear, over the shoulder, down into the uh, abdomen so that you know you don't um, stick it in too far. <coughs> and um, you pass it down as the baby's crying. Um, and uh, uh, it may immediately go down as they swallow. For older children, we're going to have them drink something as we're putting it down, and that way uh, through their nose or in, even in their mouth, having them swallow helps us facilitate that into the stomach. But a crying baby like this, trying to pass it, um, sometimes they may not swallow that. It may end up in the lungs. It may roll up into a ball in the back of the throat. I've actually seen it come out the nose. Um, so it can be a challenge putting in an oral gastric tube. Some cardiac arrest risk factors, uh, certainly uh, inter intrauterine asphyxia, uh, premature birth, uh, drugs administered to the mother, um, congenital neuromuscular disease, congenital malformations in the, in the fetus, uh, intrapartum hypoxemia, uh, remember primary and secondary apnea and the difference, uh, bradycardia if left untreated, um, persistent fetal circulation, pulmonary hypertension. Um, some other things would uh, include the need for uh, increasing risk of uh, cardiac arrest would be intrauterine asphyxia, prematurity, drugs administered to the mother. Oh, they just repeated that slide over again. All right, so techniques for doing basic life support. We're all familiar with the um, uh, thumb encircling the uh, – hands encircling the chest technique, where you have your thumbs resting on the sternum below the nipple line. And you not only want to push with your thumbs, you want to squeeze with your fingers. You want to knead that chest. It's a better way of doing CPR and it moves more blood. As a single rescuer, we teach folks the two-finger method. Uh, and the only reason that we teach them that as a single rescuer is that they'd be off the chest too long, switching back and forth between um, – the uh, thumbs and circling hands and encircling the chest technique and uh, giving the breaths. Your compression ventilation ratios, you want to deliver your compression smoothly. You want to compress one third the depth of the chest and you compress to ventilate uh, three to one, uh, which is just far different than we're taught with um, children and babies where it's still 30 to 1 as a single rescuer and 15 and 2 uh, as, a, uh, as a team. But with neonates, we're going to compress um, at a ratio of uh, 3 to 1. Um, we'll complete the cycle every 2 seconds. Um, in other words, 3 compressions, 1 breath occurs in 2 seconds. So it's quick. Uh, 90 compressions, 30 breaths a minute. Uh, after 30 seconds, recheck the heart rate. Stop compressions when the heart rate's greater than 60. Uh, if it's less than 60, continue to do the CPR. And then as paramedics, we start thinking about um, things to get the heart rate up once we've corrected the uh, hypoxia and the hypercarbia um, by reestablishing adequate oxygenation and ventilation. It may require us to look at drugs like uh, epinephrine, um, 
and we can give those either uh, intraosseously. Um, it is not within the scope of practice of a uh, paramedic in Iowa uh, and in most states uh, to give medications through the umbilical vein. Uh, endotracheal intubation, uh, you might have to do intubation or at least visualize the glottic opening to perform uh, uh, suctioning of uh, meconium. Um, ineffective bag mass ventilations, it's simple. The chest does not rise or fall. Um, chest compressions, and we get them back, certainly is a, a, a reason to think about um, endotracheal intubation. Um, as far as endotracheal medication administration, we just we just don't recommend uh, in anybody uh, giving medications through an endotracheal tube. If that's the only thing that you have, excuse me, then that might be a that might be okay. But if that's the only thing that you have, we know that uh, when you give the drugs down the ET tube, you have to double the dose. Uh, that's a whole lot of liquid, a whole lot of water. Uh, we also don't know how much of the drug is actually being absorbed into the bloodstream. We know that some of it is. So with the advent of intraosseous infusions, um, you know, you pretty much are guaranteed to be able to give the drugs through an IV. <coughs> Special resuscitation situations might require intubations like drownings, um, those sort of things. You want to use a straight blade, not a curved blade. Uh, straight blade, if you remember, um, just goes beyond the um, beyond the uh, epiglottis and picks it straight up, uh, rather than using a curved blade, which ends up uh, into the vallecula, a little soft tissue pocket um, above the epiglottis and at the base of the tongue. Um, it's said that you don't have as good a visualization with a curved blade and, and can uh, certainly cause more trauma or have a, uh, if you're not seeing what you need to see and you're using a curved blade, um, you know, placing it in a position where you can wrench back and, and really do some soft tissue damage. Um, some other indications to use an ET tube on an, on an infant uh, certainly would include um, uh, uh, if you've got meconium and you need to suction that out, um, sometimes you suction the uh, posterior oral pharynx all you can, and then you go to uh, put an ET tube in and you visualize that glottic opening and it's all full of meconium. Um, then you may have to pass a tube and then just suction the meconium out through the tube. If you can't get the chest to rise and fall with a BVM, then you may need some other airway adjunct. Um, if you're doing chest compressions, we need to get them intubated so that we can get end-tidal CO2, which will tell us the effectiveness of our uh, CPR, uh, as well as return of spontaneous circulation. Um, if you're doing again, if you're doing chest compressions, we're gonna we're gonna be uh, uh, intubating the um, using an ET tube. Uh, medication administration, mention that again. I don't know why this slide comes back a second time or they mention the same th thing the uh, second time. But just remember with ET uh, medication administration, it's, um, it's, not, uh, it's not easy to do. If you're getting good chest rise and fall with a BBM, that's probably what you should do. Uh, endotracheal intubation in, in neonates and, and uh, pediatric Patience has been shown to be very difficult, uh, not high success rates, and um, uh, increase in mortality rates when it's when it's done in the field. Um, once you get the patient uh, intubated, uh, some of the tubes have a little black mark around the uh, bottom of the tube, and that's a, a vocal cord marker. Uh, and that needs to pass beyond the vocal cords. And then you want to make sure that you uh, uh, make note of the centimeter marking uh, on the tube at the newborn's upper lip. Because it's really easy, even with tube holders, it's really easy for these tubes to migrate deeper and end up in the uh, left, uh, right main stem uh, or to uh, migrate their way out. Um, if you have a sudden worsening after you've confirmed that the patient has been intubated, that could be 
um, the result of a tube dislodgement. Um, it could be the result of the tube that's become obstructed, uh, covered with mucus. Uh, it could be the result of uh, a pneumothorax caused naturally in a, in a newborn uh, or with aggressive or overzealous bag mass ventilation on a part of the paramedic uh, and your equipment may not be uh, working properly. But if you go through that dope mnemonic and you rule everything out and, and um, uh, it's still worse after the um, uh, after the uh, or there's a sudden worsening after the intubation, then um, then you might want to consider removing the ET tube and trying something else. Routes of medication administration in newborn IV is preferred, and you can you can obtain that either through uh, you know an uh, a observable vein which you may find in the uh, AC joint, uh, top of the head, uh, top of the foot. Um, those are real common sites that you can look for for uh, starting your uh, IV. Uh, the umbilical vein catheterization can be done, but not by um, paramedics in Iowa. Um, some medications and fluids to consider during resuscitation include volume expanders. So if if the infant if the neonate has evidence of blood loss. Um, or signs of hypovolemia, then we need to replace the uh, volume with normal saline. Um, <coughs> medications that we consider using in the newborn or in the <coughs> in uh, infant resuscitation include epinephrine, and the dose of epinephrine in the newborn is 0 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilo. Uh, so if I had a three kilo kid, that would be um, 0 0.03 milligrams. And that's all fine and dandy to know the milligram dose of uh, epinephrine that I have to give during resuscitation. But as you'll see when we do the PALS, uh, you're standing there with an adult uh, epi, epi, epi uh, prefilled syringe uh, that has um, 1 milligram in 10 ml. And you have to figure out how much liquid is 0 0.3 milligrams. Um, so we'll go over how to do that in the PALS class. Uh, also remember that um, they don't have, neonates have very poor sugar stores, uh, and so if their mental status is altered, even the stress of birth could cause them to be hypoglycemic. And with newborns, we give D10, and I'm just going to use the rule of 50. Uh, whatever it is I have to give, and we'll go over this in PALS as well, um, if I've got to give D10 to a newborn, uh, I'm going to use a rule of 50. I'm going to divide 10 into 50, and the dose of my D10 is 5 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. Uh, naloxone, certainly something that you consider, particularly in a limp baby. Um, sodium, bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate is not something that we routinely administer uh, without knowing in a live baby that they do have metabolic acidosis. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> it's not likely that we're going to give sodium bicarb in the field. Some other post-resuscitation care. Let's say that you do uh, get them back um, once you've successfully resuscitated them. Monitor their heart rate, their respiratory rate, their blood pressure, their temperature, their oxygen sats. Um, so reassess their vital signs frequently. Maintain normal body temperature, keep them warm, uh, recheck their blood glucose if they've not done so already, assess their respiratory effort, and if their work of breathing is inadequate, then you're going to need to assist their ventilations. Um, detect possible complications of the resuscitation. Treat hypotension with volume expanders and vasopressors. You want to expand the volume first if you believe the cause of their problem is volume loss. And if that doesn't work and their lungs are clear, um, uh, I mean, if, if their lungs are clear, you want to give them volume expanders. And if uh, that doesn't work, then you want to look at vasopressors, but only after you've expanded the volume with, with uh, saline. Treat seizures if they're present with a benzodiazepine. Uh, establish vascular access, whether it be IV or IO. Uh, administer fluid therapy as appropriate. And when we give fluid boluses in kids, it's 20 mils per kilo uh, is what we end up giving them. So uh, um, when I have this uh, neonate, I would have to figure out what they weigh in kilos based on the Braslow tape. 
uh, or the length based colored tape uh, and that would tell me how many kilos and I would uh, I would then know the fluid bolus to give them remember in these small children when you give them a fluid bolus uh, you're giving them 25% uh, of their blood volume uh, so a single fluid bolus uh, should go a real long way in these kids and you should see some drastic improvement uh, if they don't uh, and you're um, required to give a second bolus uh, remember now you're at 50 percent of their volume has been replaced by saline um, document your observations and your ac actions we're going to look at some specific newborn situations here like meconium aspiration um, meconium collects in the di digestive tract of the fetus and forms uh, the fetus's first stool. Uh, if the fetus then has a bowel movement uh, during birth while in the birth canal, uh, they can aspirate some of this meconium. So when the head is delivered, um, if they're covered in a, a thick, sticky, greenish-black um, stuff, then you know that that's meconium. And if it is swallowed, um, uh, or if it gets in the trachea, uh, because it is thick and sticky, it can plug the trachea and make it very difficult for um, uh, the newborn to be breathe or even for you to uh, assist their ventilation. Uh, meconium is made up of swallowed amniotic fluid, mucus, fine hair, blood, and bile. Um, Meconium aspiration uh, may often be present in a fetal distress situation. Uh, so prior to birth, if you have them on a fetal heart monitor and you're monitoring their uh, the fetal activity, if they have a D cell, and uh, which would indicate uh, um, uh, you know some sort of uh, fetal stress um, or fetal distress. Um, it may be the result of meconium aspiration, but you'll know that when the head starts to be delivered, it's it's covered in this uh, green, yellowish, thick um, meconium. Um, the death rate obviously is higher when meconium aspiration occurs. It can cause a complete or partial airway obstruction. Uh, meconium aspiration. If the meconium is really watery, then that may not require any sort of emergency care. But if it's very thick and particulate, uh, you're going to have to uh, address cleaning it up. Um, aggressive airway management is necessary. Uh, do not stimulate the newborn to breathe if they're full of meconium in their mouth. Uh, oftentimes, again, you can, at the head, uh, in a thick meconium stain, um, you can... Um, use your laryngoscope and blade uh, to visualize that opening, that glottic opening, and visualize the hypopharynx and see whether or not it's full of meconium. And if it is, begin aggressive suctioning uh, there at the perineum. Um, once you have them all um, cleaned out, um, then uh, administer 100% oxygen, keep them warm, all the things you'd normally do. Now, um, pneumothorax can occur in, in uh, neonates as well as uh, adults and children, and the, um, the landmarks are no different. It's the uh, second or third intercostal space, midclavicular line. Um, you know, you may not have to use that three-inch needle that we use on adults, uh, but put it on the end of a syringe, start pushing it into the chest, uh, and when you draw free air easily, um, you know that you're in that in that area um, where you where you need to be and this would be for spontaneous pneumothorax or a pneumothorax that's been caused by um, aggressive overzealous bagging on the part of the of the paramedic uh, apnea is uh, certainly a, a newborn situation that you may deal with um, if it's prolonged uh, hypoxemia a uh, little different than hypoxia. Hypoxia is lack of oxygen. Hypoxemia is lack of oxygen in the blood, uh, as evident by a low pulse oximetry reading. Um, low um, hypoxemia is going to lead to bradycardia. So when you see bradycardia in any child, I want you to think hypoxia. Fix the hypoxia and the bradycardia go away. Um, serious apnea is defined as breathing sensation longer than 20 seconds. 
um, with any duration with cyanosis or sinus bradycardia. And we see uh, apnea primarily in premature babies, those exposed to certain uh, drugs during the delivery, uh, and those that were prolonged difficult labors. Um, <clears throat> Apnea is caused by hypoxia, hypoxemia, can be caused by hypothermia, ventilation defects, oxygen delivery disturbances, CNS depression from, from certain uh, drugs the mother may have received just prior to birth. And uh, when you have an apneic newborn, um, you want to start first with stimulation. Flick the soles of the feet, rub the back, call out, baby, baby, make some noise, um, lie them flat, uh, put a bag valve mask on them, uh, turn on the oxygen. Uh, and it's normal during this part of the resuscitation to use 100% um, oxygen. Remember that their first breaths are going to usually be more than 19 centimeters of water or 20 centimeters of water, which is what your pop-off valves are designed to do, so you might have to disable your pop-off valve in order to get enough pressure to cause the chest to rise gently. You may have to provide suction if the airway is uh, obstructed with lots of secretions, and it doesn't take a lot in these little, little tiny airways of infants. Uh, and you may have to begin chest compressions if the heart rate is less than 60 and the um, newborn is unresponsive. Uh, with apnea, you also may consider endotracheal intubation, and these are some reasons that you would consider endotracheal intubation. Heart rate's greater than 60 despite bag mass ventilation. Um, so uh, you have a patient who is bradycardic, uh, unresponsive, so you assist their ventilations for 30 seconds, and uh, if that doesn't increase their heart rate, then you throw in the chest compressions and continued ventilation, and at uh, 60 seconds total, if the heart rate's not come up at all, then we need to think about uh, endotracheal intubation and continuing with our CPR in that unresponsive uh, um, uh, neonate. Um, if you're going to be providing prolonged positive pressure ventilation, you know you're going to be bag valving them for a long period of time, uh, then you may consider endotracheal intubation because no matter how good we are and how much we rise, watch that little chest rise, um, we're always going to overventilate and give them more tidal volume than uh, what they actually need because we have no way of of measuring that effectively other than chest rise uh, in the non-intubated patient. Um, uh, if they've got prolonged apnea, they've got central cyanosis despite positive pressure ventilation, you want to make sure that you confirm tube placement with, uh, if at all possible, uh, end tidal CO2 and uh, both a, a waveform and a number. Um, you want to hook them up to a pulse oximetry, a heart monitor. Again, so vitally important to maintain normal body temperature. Um, get an IV line established. If that's not going to work, then an IO certainly would work. And remember with neonates and infants and children, we have multiple sites to do the IO. And we'll look at those in PALS as well. You want to check their blood glucose level because it's often low. Um, you know, bradycardia is typically, it's defined as any rate less than 60 is considered bradycardic. So a slower heart rate is bradycardia. Um, it's primarily caused by structural heart disease, um, but it can be a, a slow rate from a non-cardiac cause as well. And just remember that uh, as the heart rate drops, so does cardiac output, and as cardiac output drops, so does blood pressure. Causes of bradycardia, the most common cause of bradycardia is going to be hypoxia from upper airway obstruction, uh, secretions of foreign body aspiration, uh, tongue on the back of the throat. Uh, assess the respiratory rate and effort to see if there's an increased work of breathing. Remember that in uh, newborns that just like with um, uh, children, um, you know, they may, their efforts may include things like uh, grunting may include things like um, strider, um, uh, intercostal retractions, head bobbing, things that would indicate that they're working really hard uh, to breathe. Uh, if they have not 
uh, clamped and cut the umbilical cord, then certainly you can feel the um, umbilical stump for a brachial. Uh, you can feel the umbilical stump or the brachial artery to determine whether or not they have a pulse. Uh, and if they have one, you want to assess the rate. Uh, it should be above 60 uh, and uh, whether it's nice and strong. Treatment for bradycardia. Treat the hypoxia and the bradycardia goes away. Open the airway, suction, position, positive pressure ventilation. If the heart rates are less than 60, throw in CPR uh, and then give uh, the IV medications um, that we had talked about. Prematurity occurs when the baby weighs anywhere from 6 tenths to 2.2 pounds. Um, excuse me, 6 tenths to 2.2 kilograms or somewhere between 1.3 to 4.5 pounds or if they're born before the 30, 37th week of, pre of pregnancy. Patients who are, are newborns who are premature um, are more prone to respiratory suppression, more prone to hypoglycemia, hypothermia, infection, brain abscesses, and um, uh, blood pressure changes. Uh, intraventricular hemorrhage uh, may occur in, uh, pre with prematurity as well as uh, serum uh, osmolarity fluctuations. Um, remember they have a very large trunk and short extremities. Um, when they are, are born prematurely, uh, their skin may be transparent, has less wrinkles, less subcutaneous fat, and uh, they may require resuscitation, which always begins with uh, opening the airway. Uh, then consider bag mass ventilation, chest compressions if less than 60 and unresponsive, maintain adequate body temperature, uh, assess pulse oximetry, heart monitor, gain IVIO access, and transport. Um, with prematurity, the respiratory control center may be um, underdeveloped, um, and so it's very common to see a respiratory distress in uh, uh, premature babies born less than 2.6 pounds or less than uh, 30 weeks of gestation. Uh, as far as respiratory distress and cyanosis, uh, you would assess uh, in your patient who was tachypneic, had paradoxic breathing. Uh, one side of the chest is moving and the other is staying still. Um, periodic breathing, which uh, might be chain stokes. Uh, intercostal retractions, um, which uh, could be a, um, uh, just an indication that they're working really hard to breathe. Nasal flaring, their nares aren't quite well developed like ours, so they have a tendency to flare out quite easy. So nasal flaring is an early uh, assessment of respiratory distress. And then they may grunt. Uh, 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 uh. And that grunting that you hear uh, in these um, newborns is a, uh, a sign of uh, what we call auto-peep. Um, they're trying to stent their little airways opening open by uh, providing some um, uh, some pressure in increase uh, positive end expiratory pressure. <clears throat> With respiratory distress and cyanosis in the newborn, the airway is always the first priority. And remember, it takes hardly anything to obstruct it. So make certain that you uh, position, you suction. Um, you administer your bag a mass device and ventilate at an adequate rate. You want to have a pulse oximetry on them. Keep their uh, oxygen saturations above 95%. Um, if you're not getting anywhere, you may need to intubate the trachea, begin chest compressions. Um, uh, one part of the chest compressions, of course, is um, uh, end tidal CO2 monitoring, which will tell you how good your uh, chest compressions are. Uh, the other thing to consider is uh, getting a glucose level because they may be uh, hypoglycemic. And during all the resuscitation, um, during all the respiratory distress, um, and working them up, r remember the um, um, they dissipate a, a tremendous amount of body heat to the environment, uh, so there it's very easy for them to become hypothermic. So you want to maintain normal body temperature. Seizures you may see seizures in newborn. 
uh, of course, it's it's an abnormal. It's it's abnormal, and when you see it, it's a sign that something else is going on. Uh, most common causes of seizures in newborns include hypoxic ischemic encephalopathies, intracranial bleeding, uh, CNS infections, uh, CNS malformations, metabolic disturbances like hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis. Um, drug withdrawal, if the mother was uh, took drugs during um, her illegal drugs or designer drugs during her pregnancy and, and um, uh, the infant may go through with drug withdrawal symptoms, uh, they may um, be born with uh, developmental abnormalities. Uh, it could be also the results of amino and organic acid metabolism disorders. Um, in a newborn, certainly they're not going to diagnose right off the bat. Um, epilepsy. Um, there are about 26 or so different uh, types of epilepsy. Um, so that's that's not going to be uh, the initial diagnosis of a seizure. You're going to look for more of these sort of things. Seizures can be subtle where you wouldn't hardly see them at all. They can be tonic where the tone of the muscles tightens up and that's it. Clonic would include the rhythmic jerking. Uh, of the muscles, and myoclonic would be um, loss of all muscle tone. They just become flaccid. Um, management would include uh, managing the airway, ensuring adequate oxygenation, suction heavy secretions, give them some oxygen, assist their ventilations, um, all after stopping the seizure. Um, do a 12 EDCG, obtain a blood glucose level, because remember that high sugars can cause seizures, uh, as well as um, low sugars can cause seizures um, or be caused by seizures. Because during the seizure, you use a tremendous amount of energy, uh, and so sugars can be often low as a result of the seizure. So get a blood glucose on these children, roll them up onto their side so they don't aspirate, maintain normal body temperature and transport. As far as fever, fever is um, defined as a rectal temperature greater than 100.4 Fahrenheit. Uh, fever in the newborn weakens them. They don't have a very healthy immune system right off the bat. Um, during a fever, because of the increased metabolism, they're going to use more glucose. Uh, fever also requires them to breathe. Uh, they often breathe a little deeper and faster when they're sick, and that, uh, along with the uh, rise in temperature, uh, may dehydrate them. <coughs> Again, they have uh, immature immune systems that are prone to uh, infections. Causes of fever include upper respiratory infections like um, epiglottitis, lower respiratory infections, uh, sepsis, meningitis, urinary tract infections, ear infections, and gastroenteritis. Uh, with fever, you want to watch out for mental status changes. Um, the skin can be pink, mottled, ashen, or pale. Um, they could have a petechiae rash, and that's not a good sign. Petechiae are little raised red um, bumps all over the, <clears throat> all over the skin. Um, Initially, treatment is supportive. Um, some would have uh, would advocate having you to use cool washcloths uh, in addition to administering antipyretics. Um, but antipyretics in that age group um, would be very hard to uh, determine. Open their airway, assist their breathing if necessary. Do chest compressions if their heart rate's less than 60. Um, do not use ice cold. Uh, water baths, um, and um, you know, have uh, IV if possible. Obtain an IV, and if um, part of the protocol, consider a little fluid bolus, especially if you suspect dehydration from the fever. Hypothermia is is a heat reduction um, uh, decrease and a heat loss increase, so they're losing heat faster than they can produce it. Um, hypothermia can be a late sign of sepsis as well, but typically the, the child is uh, uh, obviously sick in that, in that case where sepsis uh, causes cold shock. Um, they have petechiae, they may have purpura, uh, those sort of things. Um, uh, hypothermia can lead to metabolic acidosis, pulmonary hypertension, and hypoxemia. Uh, 
We get rid of heat through a variety of factors. Uh, we evaporate heat through the evaporation of sweat. Uh, we conduct heat from uh, our hot bodies to cooler surfaces. Uh, and as air blows across our bodies, we convect heat, um, much like blowing on hot soup, uh, how it will cool the soup down. Uh, and then we radiate heat out of our heads and certainly our uh, sides and thighs and <coughs> just off our body in general. Signs and symptoms of hypothermia in a neonate includes pale color, cool skin, peripheral cyanosis, slow, shallow respiratory effort or apnea, bradycardia, central cyanosis, uh, irritability and lethargy. Treating for hypothermia is to recognize it, open their airway, make sure that they're breathing adequately, assist ventilations if necessary, perform chest compressions if heart rates are less than 60, uh, dry the skin, wrap them in warm blankets, check their blood glucose level, and give them uh, warm IV fluids. Uh, hypoglycemia, by definition, is a, a blood glucose level less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, we often use 60 in the adult population, but um, they use uh, less than 40 in the um, in uh, the newborn is considered uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, if allowed to continue, hypoglycemia will lead to irreversible brain damage. Some risk factors for hypoglycemia include if the mother had diabetes, chances are the infant may as well. But in that particular case, um, you know, if, if the mother had diabetes, um, <clears throat> the infant, if they are born with low blood glucose, as the mother managed her diabetes, um, that's one thing. If the infant has diabetes, that's a disease of high blood sugars, not low blood sugars. Uh, preterm birth makes them at risk of hypoglycemia. If they're hypoxic or asphyxic, if they're hypothermic, uh, if they're small for their gestational age, uh, sepsis um, uh, toxemias, if they're the smaller of the twin, um, if they've had some CNS hemorrhage, and if there are signs of respiratory distress. Jitteriness, twitching, seizing are all signs of hypoglycemia in the newborn. Cyanosis, respiratory distress, limpness, eye rolling, lethargy, high pitched cry, apnea, irregular breathing, all might be signs of hypoglycemia. Vomiting has often occurs in newborns as well um, during those first feedings. It could be the result of what's called a pyloric stenosis. Um, that's a narrowing of the uh, um, of the intestines, uh, uh, which may cause a uh, small bowel obstruction. Vomiting can also be the result of increased intracranial pressure. Remember, in those low birth weight uh, newborns, their uh, brain tissue is is very soft and 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 um, gelatin, gelatin like and um, uh, uh, capillaries can easily rupture causing bleeds inside the head um, duodenal ulcers stress ulcers uh, overfeeding is probably the most common reason that newborns vomit uh, ineffective burping uh, they may have an allergy to milk um, you want to look to make sure that uh, what they're blowing vomiting is not um, dark and bloody uh, uh, which would be a certainly a, a serious um, uh, condition. Uh, the other great risk with vomiting is the risk of aspiration. That's why we need to get them onto their side as soon as possible, have suction available. Um, uh, if the vomitus uh, of a non-bile stain fluid, um, uh, then you know that, um, you know, that's coming from the, the uh, the feedings that they've had, whereas if, if somebody's throwing up bile, then that, that's, that indicates that there's nothing left to throw up, and um, they're, they're just getting rid of what's being secreted in their GI tract. Um, they may uh, also suffer from GI reflux. Um, oftentimes with vomiting, they may have a distended stomach, like if they have an acute abdomen, their stomach may be distended, uh, especially if they have uh, gastroenteritis, um, they may show signs of infection. They may, again, have signs of increased intracranial pressure, signs of drug withdrawal, uh, open the airway, uh, suction, keep their secretions clear, uh, position them, 
properly, uh, apply a pulse oximetry. Uh, again, if their vomiting is frequent and long enough that uh, leads to periods of hypoxia, then we need to, when they're not vomiting, provide positive pressure ventilation, but keep an eye out for uh, the potential for aspiration. Roll them on their side if possible and attach a cardiac monitor. Diarrhea is a normal uh, stool pattern changes uh, that we see. Um, uh, instead of the stool being soft uh, or formed, it is just extremely liquidy. Um, it'll lead to uh, dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Um, maybe the result of overfeeding as well. Um, causes of diarrhea include overfeeding, uh, bacterial or viral infections, gastroenteritis. They may have lactose intolerance and uh, be allergic to the milk. Um, phototherapy treatment may cause uh, diarrhea. Um, Neonatal abstinence syndrome may cause diarrhea. Hyperthyroidism may cause diarrhea. Uh, malabsorption, not absorbing the nutrients properly, may cause uh, diarrhea. Cystic fibrosis. Um, neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, we see that in narcotic addicted mothers. Uh, the child will develop. Uh, withdrawal symptoms within the first 48 to 72 hours of, of birth and um, go through the same sort of uh, withdrawal process that a um, you know a narcotic addict would go through to include seizures and and uh, it can be life-threatening <clears throat> um, thyrotoxicosis again is thyroid storm uh, take standard precautions, look for signs of dehydration, open the airway, assure adequate respirations by applying a pulse oximeter, administer oxygen when necessary, heart rates less than 60, provide chest compressions, hook them up to a cardiac monitor, establish IVs. Um, risk factors include um, uh, cephalopelvic disproportion, shoulder dyscocia, uh, post-maturity, prolonged difficult labors, uh, an explosive delivery, uh, or a uh, abnormal um, presentation like a, um, uh, like a limb presentation or a breach. Cranial injuries um, may occur uh, as part of the molding of the head. Remember that uh, newborns, uh, the bones of the head, the uh, four pair on each side, the two frontal lobes, the two parietal lobes, the two temporal lobes, and the two occipital lobes are not fused together, um, so they can override and shift. Um, you may see redness, abrasions, bruising, um, subcutaneous fat necrosis. Uh, you may see subconjunctival retinal hemorrhage from a rise in ICP. Um, subperiosteal hemorrhage, uh, and uh, skull fractures may be common um, uh, as a result of, uh, uh, you know, dropping the baby or a blow to the head. Assessment findings uh, in include um, uh, diffuse and echomotic swelling of the scalp and soft tissue that might indicate a cranial injury, uh, paralysis uh, below the level of the spinal cord, Paralysis of an upper arm with or without paralysis of the forearm, paralysis of the diaphragm. And if we remember our dermatomes, you know, that might give us an idea of where the spinal cord injury has occurred as a result of birth. Um, you may also see uh, one-sided face movement when crying, indicating that one side of their face is paralyzed. Lack of uh, free arm movement on a, a fractured clavicle side because uh, fractured clavicle can be uh, uh, certainly a, a complication associated with birth, uh, especially with uh, large shoulders and trying to get them, um, you know, to pass um, under the pelvic bone. Um, lack of spontaneous movement of the affected extremity, hypoxia and shock, all can be birth injuries. Uh, to treat uh, a newborn birth injury, provide adequate oxygenation and ventilation, chest compressions for heart rates less than 60, maintain normal body temperature, uh, contact medical direction and transport. 
All right, so um, that ends Chapter 36, uh, Neonatal. Uh, I'm going to get right after uh, the uh, pediatric lecture um, this week yet, so we can get some of those on the books as well. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. I'll uh, talk to you soon.